Well, good morning. My name is Jared Martin, and I'm one of the pastors here at Mount Gravatt. So a big welcome to all our visitors, and it's really good to have you all here. At the moment, we're in the middle of a sermon series on spiritual warfare. You can probably guess from these cool banners that we have and the table of different bits and pieces up the front. So it's really, I love it. Hey, it's cool to come into church and see something interesting that relates to our topic and relates to what we're going through in the Bible. As we've been learning the last few weeks, all of us are engaged in a war against Satan. The enemy of God, the enemy of Jesus, the enemy of our souls and the enemy of truth. There was a time in the life of Martin Luther when this war was so real that he picked up the inkwell that was sitting on his desk and threw it at the devil. The ink stain remained on the wall for years to come as a reminder of this conflict. Our enemy is Satan. Satan and his army of fallen angels run their wicked anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-truth, anti-life campaign throughout every city and every home in this world. Every moment that we're alive, we are engaged in this spiritual battle. That's why this sermon series is so important. That's why the Apostle Paul writes, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore... Put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Let's pray. Dear God, please help us to recognise this spiritual battle that we're in and to stand firm in the armour of God. Amen. I start off with a present for everyone. I have these handouts and I invite the deacons to pass them around. There's one for everyone. And so I made these handouts because I don't want the sermon just to be me talking, you listening, and then go home. And it's so easy to forget sometimes. I made these because when someone says, tell me about faith or what is faith, what does faith mean? I don't want you to, to, to offload your Christian duty to YouTube and say, oh, watch this video or, or listen to this podcast or, or go and, and speak to a pastor or an elder. I want you guys to feel confident in what you believe, confident that you have something to share. And so I think these handouts are a great place to start. They could be the basis for a Bible study, perhaps, or the basis for a discussion or however you choose to use them. It's, I want to give you guys something to take home, look at during the week and go, hey, yeah, I learnt this. I'm confident that I can share this. I can share this with someone. So as you can see on the handouts, we'll be looking at four main questions. The first one is, what is a shield? What is a shield of faith? What are the fiery darts and who is the evil one? There's no right or wrong answers. No one's going to come and check it and mark it. Uh, I'll share with you what I think, and you can write down what you would like. On the back, you'll notice it says, my response to God and my response to others. And this is not something I'll be covering in the sermon. It's not something I can give you an answer for, because this is your personal response. This is how the sermon, this is how what you've learned from the Bible impacts you. And so I invite you to fill that out sometime today. Thank you to the deacons for your help.
Okay, so far in this sermon series, we've looked at the first three pieces of God's armor. The first one is the belt of truth. Good. The breastplate of righteousness. And the shoes or the sandals of, yeah, the gospel of peace. Good. Today we're looking at the next piece of armor. So turn with me in your Bibles or slide with me on your devices. And we go to Ephesians 6.16. 6, Ephesians 6 verse 16. The Bible says, above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Notice that the Apostle Paul introduces the three remaining pieces of armour with the words above all. Paul does this because there is a difference between the first three pieces of armour and the second three pieces of armour. We can see this when we look at the verbs Paul uses. So back to English class. In verses 14 and 15, Paul says, having the belt, having the breastplate, having the shoes. Some of the newer Bible translations sacrifice this subtlety that's in the Greek in order to simplify the English, but Paul's use of the word having is important to our understanding of this passage. The idea of the verb having is that something is permanent. It's what you permanently have on. It's a purposeful decision. It's a long-range preparation. If you were a Roman soldier and there was a break in the battle, you would go and have a rest. You'd throw down your big helmet and huge shield and heavy sword, but you would never take off your belt or your breastplate or your shoes. You never took those items off because they were your most basic defence, your most basic protection against an attack. When the enemy started attacking again, you'd do what Paul says in verses 16 and 17 and take your shield, take your helmet and take your sword and go back into battle. The first three pieces of armour are your most basic protection against an attack, while the second three allow you to fight back and stand your ground. If you only had the first three pieces of armour, that should be enough to protect yourself. It should be enough to protect yourself. If you're wearing your belt and you have the truth of God's character and love, If you're wearing your breastplate and you have confidence in God's righteousness, and if your feet are prepared with the gospel of peace, that should be enough to survive this spiritual war, shouldn't it? God's truth, God's righteousness, and God's gospel is enough for every sinner to survive this spiritual war. But... God also gives us his shield of faith and his helmet of salvation and his sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God wants us to have double the protection so that we have no reason to be afraid and every reason to trust that he'll keep us safe. In John chapter 10, we discover that our lives are in the hands of both God the Father and Jesus and that no one can take us out. It's like a little child learning to walk, right? They have one hand that's held by their dad, one hand that's held by their mum, and they're holding this, this little child up and keeping them safe so they don't fall over. And that child is us. And God and Jesus are holding us up and keeping us safe. We are living in a spiritual war zone, but God assures us And Jesus reassures us that we'll be safe in God's armour. When you have God's belt and you have the truth of his character and love, when you're wearing God's breastplate 
and you have confidence in his righteousness, when your feet are prepared with God's gospel of peace, then you are ready for God's shield. The Bible says, above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Have you ever seen movies like Gladiator or Ben-Hur or if you've read the Asterix and Obelix books, some of my favourite, you'll, you'll know what a Roman shield looks like. One of the shields commonly used by the soldiers and gladiators looked like this. It was circular, it was made of metal, and it was about the diameter of your arm. These shields were really good because they were relatively lightweight and they were easy to move around, so you could defend yourself really easy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Greek word for these shields is palmer, but it's not the word that Paul uses to describe the shield of faith. The word Paul uses is therion, which doesn't describe a, sh a small metal shield. It describes a massive timber shield. Historians tell us that this shield was about 120 centimetres high and 75 centimetres wide, so perhaps like the, like the pulpit here. The average height of a Roman soldier was 170 centimetres in height, about this tall, so they could easily get down and crouch behind this shield and they would be safe from anything that was shot at them. They would be fully protected. These shields weren't used in hand-to-hand -hand combat because they were so heavy, but they were designed for full protection in the initial stages of an ancient battle. You've probably seen pictures like this before. You've probably seen it in movies, and the idea is that the Roman soldiers would link their shields together, these big, heavy Thurion shields. They would link them together so that the arrows of the enemy couldn't pierce through and couldn't hit the soldiers. These fiery darts that Paul mentions couldn't get through. The new soldiers would be there, the experienced soldiers would be there, and they would link their shields together as one big group and as long as they worked together, they were safe. And so my challenge to each of us is this. Link your shield together with your fellow Christian soldiers. Draw on their experience, especially those who have been Christians for a long time. Draw on their experience. Let them help you. Let them support you in this spiritual war. The Bible says, above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. If you were just in an earthly war, you go down to Bunnings, get a few bits of timber and make a shield, couldn't you? And I'm sure we've done that maybe for children's Sabbath school or for the road to Bethlehem or some Pathfinder event. We've made these big shields. I remember making them when I was a little kid at big camp one year. But we're in a spiritual war, and so we need a spiritual shield, a shield of faith. So the big question is, what is faith? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 1. I'm sure many of you know this off by heart, but let's look it up in our Bibles. Hebrews 11 in verse 1. The Bible says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. We can have faith in lots of things, can't we? We have faith that the bank's not going to lose our money overnight, we hope. We have faith that the plane we're travelling into, our fantastic holiday, is not going to drop out the sky, we hope. And I mean, we have faith, sitting here this morning, that this building isn't going to collapse in on us. We have faith in so many things. But biblical faith 
is something different. Biblical faith means believing in God. I think it's that simple. Biblical faith means believing in God. It's the foundation for our relationship with God. Believing that he created the world in six days. Believing that he inspired the scriptures. Believing that Jesus is God. Believing that Jesus died and rose. Believing that Jesus is coming back soon. Believing that Jesus is our personal saviour. And believing that by believing, we can enter the kingdom of God. That's what faith is. Faith is believing in God. That's why in the Old Testament we read that God's people will live by faith. The New Testament makes it clear. God's people will live by faith. And in case you didn't get it, God's people will live by faith. And in case you still missed it, God's people will live by faith. When God repeats himself four times, it's important. Yeah? And this is what God says to us. God's people will live by faith. If you're a Christian, then this is how God tells you to live, to believe in him. I have a story that I'd like to share, and it's of the great Protestant missionary John G. Payton. You can see when he lived there. And Payton was working with the indigenous people of Vanuatu for a big period of his life. And Payton decided to translate the Bible into their language in Vanuatu. However, he discovered that there were no words in their vocabulary for faith. And so how would he explain this idea to them? One day he was in his hut translating and one of the indigenous people, they came running up, running so hard and just ran straight up the stairs into his hut and just collapsed in a chair. He was huffing and puffing and panting and when he finally caught his breath, he said, it's so good to rest my whole weight in this chair. As John Payton later said, I had found my word. Faith is resting your whole weight on God. That phrase entered into Peyton's translation of the Bible and it brought thousands to know Jesus. You see, faith is putting your whole weight on God. Faith is accepting that if God said it, it's true and I believe it. Faith is accepting that if God said it, it's true and I'll believe it. The Bible is filled with stories of faith and we each have ones that we relate to the most that is our favourite. And these stories are worth telling over and over again to our children, to each other, to people that we meet. But I'm not going to retell these stories now from the front. I instead have a challenge and this is what I'd like for you to do. To ask yourself these questions why do you believe in God? And why do you have faith in Him? Why do you believe in God? And why do you have faith in Him? Maybe at lunch, after church, this afternoon sometime, I want you to share these answers with someone, with your family, with whoever you're with. And there's no right or wrong answer to these questions. This is your answer, your personal answer. Having an answer, though, is important. Because having an answer is your shield in this spiritual war. Having an answer to these questions is your shield in this spiritual war. So please think about it. The Bible says, Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. 
Different Bible translations, they translate this part differently. The newer translations, you might notice in your Bible, say flaming arrows. The older ones say fiery darts. The Greek word is belos. And it carries the idea of an object or a projectile that is launched at you, on purpose, straight at you. It could be an arrow shot from a bow. This is essentially what a fiery dart is. But it could also be a javelin uh, or a spear or one of those missiles that were fired from those Roman ballistas, those big missiles that they would shoot. These items would have a metal tip and just behind the tips the Roman soldiers would put a substance called pitch and it was highly flammable and just before shooting the fiery dart or the arrow or the javelin they would, they would light this on fire and then shoot it at you. This is what the Bible is saying with flaming arrows and fiery darts. To defend against these fiery darts, the opposing soldiers would cover their big timber shields with thick layers of leather and they would saturate this in a type of oil that, that stopped the fire from burning and it would extinguish the fiery arrow. Now, I mean, you can see this picture, you can, you can all imagine, if you were on the front lines without a shield, you were totally powerless to protect yourself. Even if you could jump around and put on your best ninja skills and jump around and the arrow only hits you in the arm or only hits you in the leg, I mean, you're halfway to being gone. But if it's a fiery arrow and it hits you anywhere, it sets you on fire and you're done. The, you're done. Fiery darts were not designed to injure. They were designed to kill. So what are these fiery darts that the Bible is talking about? These fiery darts that the evil one is shooting at us. May I suggest that these fiery darts are symbols of seducing temptations, of impurity, lust, greed, gluttony, Vanity, materialism, pride, anger, impatience, selfishness, and every other disguise that evil takes. We've seen them, and we should know what they are. These seducing temptations, they come at us from all angles, and when one hits us, it doesn't instantly kill us. But the fire begins to spread and it burns our life, it destroys us. When the arrow hits us, we stop being content with what we have and we begin to lust after everything we don't have, whether it's a material thing or another person. Whatever it is, we are never satisfied. Dissatisfaction is the heart of all sin. Not only dissatisfaction with what you do have, but dissatisfaction with what God gives you. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Satan was able to seduce Adam and Eve into being dissatisfied with God and just drag humanity into a life of evil, lying, hatred, murder and death. Satan's trick worked with the very first human beings and he tried the exact same strategy with Jesus. Which tells me that he's going to try the exact same thing with us. It's good enough for the first humans. He thought it was good enough for Jesus. I mean, he's going to have a go at us in the same way. So I think it's important that we look at Jesus and how he dealt with the devil's temptations because he sets us an example of how to hold up this shield of faith in this spiritual war. So let's have a look. Matthew chapter 4 tells us that Satan came to Jesus after Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days and for 40 nights. And he says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, 
command these stones to be bread. This temptation was designed to seduce Jesus into being dissatisfied with his human condition and to use his power to satisfy his hunger. But Jesus is prepared for battle. And look how he fights. He stands firm, holds up his shield of faith, And the devil's fiery dart is extinguished. Jesus does not discuss the temptation with the tempter, like Adam and Eve did. Jesus does not spend a single moment contemplating the devil's suggestion. He doesn't put down his shield, wait for the fiery dart to hit him in the chest, and then go, oh, oh, I wonder if that hurts. How often do we do that? Jesus knows who his enemy is and he doesn't trust the devil for one second. Jesus knows that Satan's plan is to destroy every life and kill every person. And so Jesus stands firm. He holds up his shield of faith. The devil's fiery dart still comes, still hits his shield, but it is extinguished. Satan's first fiery dart was unsuccessful, so he keeps on shooting. His second temptation was to get Jesus to stand on the highest point of the temple. It was about 100 metres above the rocks below. And then he said to Jesus, throw yourself down. Jesus had gone from the glory of heaven to the suffering of this sin-filled earth. So this temptation was designed to seduce Jesus into being dissatisfied with his earthly mission, to use his angels like a trick, I guess, to use them as a trick and quickly just convince everyone to believe in him. (laughs) Bang, here we go, look at me, I'm Jesus, believe in me. But Jesus is prepared for battle. And look how he fights, he stands firm, holds up his shield of faith, and the devil's fiery dart is extinguished. Jesus does not discuss the temptation with Satan. Jesus does not spend a single moment contemplating the devil's suggestion. Jesus knows who his enemy is, and he doesn't trust the devil for one second. Jesus knows that Satan's plan is to destroy every life and kill every person. And so Jesus stands firm and holds up his shield of faith. The devil's fiery dart still hits the shield, but it is extinguished. Satan's second fiery dart was unsuccessful, and so he keeps shooting at Jesus. He's always shooting, he's always shooting these fiery, seductive temptations. Satan's final temptation for Jesus was designed to seduce him into being dissatisfied with the worship that he received from humanity. And this attack, this temptation, it was like a thousand fiery arrows all shot at once, like that picture we saw before. This was the big one. But Jesus is prepared for battle. And look how he fights. He stands firm, holds up his shield of faith, and the devil's fiery darts are all extinguished. Jesus does not discuss the temptation with Satan. Jesus does not spend a single moment contemplating the devil's suggestion. Jesus knows who his enemy is and he doesn't trust the devil for one second. Jesus knows that Satan's plan is to destroy every life and kill every person. And so Jesus stands firm, holds up his shield of faith. The devil's fiery darts, they still come but they hit the shield and they are extinguished. 
So when Satan comes to me, when Satan comes to you and he fires all these seductive temptations into our lives and he tries to get us dissatisfied with our partner or our kids or our job or our church or our pastor or anything. There's nothing that's off limits with Satan. He will make you dissatisfied about anything he can. My challenge to you is this. Have faith. Believe in God and resist the devil. Never discuss the temptation with the tempter. Do not waste a single moment contemplating the devil's suggestion. The instant you show any curiosity, you start trying to think back and forward, that arrow hits you, it sets you on fire, and you're gone. Know who your enemy is. And never, never, never trust a single thing that he says. Above all, take up your shield of faith and watch as those seductive temptations are all extinguished. The Bible says, Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Check in your Bibles. Most of them say the evil one. It depends on your translation. Some may say the wicked, some say the devil. The Greek word is poneiros, and it means evil, bad, wicked, and malicious. It doesn't directly translate to the devil or Satan. There's different words in the Greek for that, but even just a casual reading of the Bible makes it pretty clear who this evil one truly is. The Apostle John says, We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the poneiros, the evil one. Jesus, one day, he, w- he was speaking to a group of corrupt religious people and Jesus contrasted God the Father to the devil. And Jesus made it extremely clear who this evil one was. Jesus says, If God were your father, you would love me. But you are children of your father, the devil. And you love to do the evil things he does. Satan was a murderer from the beginning. That's why we need the armour. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When Satan lies, it is consistent with his character. When he shoots those seductive temptations, it is consistent with his character because he is a liar and the father of lies. If you choose God as your father and you love Jesus... Satan is your enemy. If you make that choice and choose God as your father and love Jesus, then Satan is your enemy. If you don't choose God, I mean, well, look whose side you're on. Side of the evil, lying, hate Build murderer. So my challenge and my appeal is this. Choose Jesus. Study his life and accept his free gift of salvation. Don't reject Jesus and join the side of that evil, lying, hate-filled murderer. Choose Jesus. When Satan shoots those fiery darts at you, those seductive temptations, hold up your shield of faith and watch as every single one 
is extinguished. Choose Jesus. With Jesus on your side, you'll be victorious every single time. I have one final thought, and this is my favourite one from the whole passage. I've saved the best to last. When we go into battle in this spiritual war, we get to wear, what does the Bible say? The armour of God. This is God's armour. It's not some human armour that we make down at Bunnings, right? It's, it's not some second-rate armour that God just kind of, oh, well, they, they can have that. He doesn't want it anymore. This is God's armour. God's own armour. This is the armour that God fights in. And you know, our God has never lost a battle. Our God and our Saviour has never lost against Satan. Our God and our Saviour is always victorious. He is always, always, always victorious. I want to ram this point home. Our God and our Saviour is always, always, always victorious. This is the big point. That's why it's not just the armour, some good armour, a good suggestion, oh, look at these Roman soldiers. It's the armour of God. And that's what he gives to us. So, I'd like to finish and invite you all to stand. I invite you all to stand and to stand tall and stand proud and stand like Christian soldiers. Yeah? That's who we are, to stand tall and proud. And as we sing this final hymn, I invite you all to say in your hearts, to say to God, yes, I choose to join your winning side. God, I choose to stand victorious in your armour. Amen. Thank you.